Okay, so are any labels on the torsion pendulum? So, a little background. Torsion pendulums are all on the on our, like messages <coughs> springs and gravitational pendulums, a form of simple harmonic motion where an object rotates about an axis. You can see it in that picture there. And like Hooke's law, torsion pendulums have an analogous equation where the torque on an object is equal to the torsion constant, which is kappa times the displacement of theta. Um, each type of wire has its own designated value of for kappa, the torsion constant. Also similar to the other simple harmonic motion equations, T equals 2 pi root L over G and T equals 2 pi M over K. The equation T equals 2 pi uh, root momentum inertia over kappa, where I is momentum inertia again, describes the period of a torsion pendulum. And then if we click on this link, it's kind of a good uh, here, you can see like a mass on a spring, um, and it has that simple harmonic motion, and the same thing can be replicated with this, um, I guess like hollow pipe on a wire rotating, and that's basically what torsion is. Um, so our purpose of our indie lab was just to figure out how these pendulums worked, and then we wanted to see how they related to simple harmonic motion. It's just based on those first equations, we knew that there are a lot of similarities. And then we wanted to de uh, determine the torsion constant for a lot of materials, like we've determined the spring constant um, for various springs before. And then another cool thing we wanted to look into was how like torsion clocks work. And those are like really old like grandfather clocks and stuff like that that operate using the torsion. So our hypotheses were the greater number of wires used in a torsion system, the greater num the greater the torsion constant, and also the greater the tensile strength of a, of a certain type of wire, the greater the torsion constant. Um, we use a lot of different equipment, but I'm not going to go through all of it. Basically, for the wires we use, we use um, gardening wire, and we use um, two different uh, strengths of fishing line. And then what we attached to those types of wires were objects with uh, relatively uh, easy um, and calculable moments of inertia, such as like a wiffle ball or like a ball and cylinders and stuff of that nature. Okay, so this is sort of the diagram of our setup because when we were looking at that website, they had like this controlled, like vacuum sealed, like apparatus where you could test the uh, torsion constant without any uh, air resistance or wind resistance, so we had to sort of fashion our own using like a plastic bin and a plexiglass uh, top, you can see here. And this is a top view of the... And so there's like a little wire right here that's taped, and then there's a little hole and it's attached to, in this case, a hockey puck, and basically we got the hockey puck to... Um, like rotate back and forth and we measured it some period. So our procedure, um, I'm not really going to go into everything, but we would, this is sort of like our building of the windless chamber. Um, and then we, what we would do is we would calculate the moment of inertia by using all the various equations. Um, then we cut a, cut a piece of garden wire around the object or fasten it to the object. Um, then we would we would gently twist the wires to get the moment of the object starting with its oscillations. And then we measure multiple periods of the object and then divide by the number of periods to get the, the average period. And then we just repeat for different. And then we had the same procedure for the other part. Um, this is just for the fishing line instead of the garden wire. And oh. this is a quick video. I'm not sure we can get it on my account. Oh, okay, whatever. It's not that exciting. Um, yeah. So this is the graph for a single gardening wire. This is, um, since the equation was t equals 2 pi um, root i over g, we had to linearize okay. the graph, or yeah, i over k. To linearize the graph, we had to score the period. Um, and so you can see it's pretty linear. And we calculated the uh, torsion constant using the slope to be 1.94 times 10 to the negative 30 meters for the single gardening wire.
And then we re repeated the same um, experiment, but with two garden wires braided together, and the um, torsion constant increased here. And then for three, it also increased. And we did the same procedure to find the torsion constant. And then you can see there was kind of like a linear relationship between like the number of wires braided together and the torsion constant. And that just makes sense because the more braided together, the more strength they should have. Um, and then we did some video analysis on the wiffle ball just by uh, analyzing a point on the edge as it uh, oscillated around and you can see it's, it looks like some harmonic motion. Because it is. And um, then, can we talk about that? Yeah, sure. And then for the second part, we tested um, two like strengths, tensile strengths of um, fishing line. And this one was 13.6 um, kilograms. And once again, there was a really like fairly linear um, graph that was produced by this. And then we also tested a stronger tensile strength and um, <coughs> the torsion constant increased as well. So we like, there wasn't really anything we can compare for like error analysis. Um, yes. What is tensile strength? It's like basically like how much weight um, the fishing line could hold like with a certain length of wire. I forget what that amount was. Cool. Um, and so we just determined this like constant of proportionality <coughs> Uh, between the tensile strengths and the torsion constants, and they were almost identical, and basically that backs up that they're um, directly proportional. Oh. Um. Oh. Okay. So basically, we had a video of uh, the, the little torsion clock that Brando gave us. Um, so basically, since the video won't work, there's like a little little uh, torsion pendulum inside that spins really fast fast and uh, every period it will move the second hand like it'll hit the second hand so the period of the of the torsion pendulum inside the clock is engineered so that every period is about a second so and that's just the uh, evidence that we found using the video analysis over there and then <coughs> uh, for sources of error um, the main thing was there's a lot of friction between um, like the wire and the top of the hole where the hole when it like was cut into the plexiglass and in the period we noticed like a lot of damping um, so that could have had a big effect on the period and then we had a lot of like irregular objects that weren't completely uniform so calculating the moment of inertia was kind of difficult and we kind of just had to do rough estimates and then Another thing was it was really hard to get all the objects to start rotating at like the same speed or angular velocity. And as a result, they started like rotating in multiple planes, which wasn't good. And then our relative error, we just did it on um, like the period of oscillation for the wiffle ball and the coefficients of proportionality, but we couldn't find like any accepted values of torsion constants, so we yeah. just kind of had to go with this. So our conclusions were, um, from our graphs and from the equation, that the, t the period squared of a torsion uh, pendulum is directly proportional to its moment of inertia, and then that, this isn't like scientifically proven, but from our data that it sort of suggests that the, the torsion constant is proportional to the number of wires you have, and also this is sort of another one of our um, conclusions that's not really necessarily scientifically proven, but that the, the ratio of the tensile strengths will be the same as the ratio of the torsion constants of two wires. Um, this supported our hypothesis, and then we also proved that torsion pendulums will form a simple harmonic motion, and that torsion clocks operate by pushing the second hand at constant intervals related to the type of period of the torsion pendulum. Any questions? I had to sit through all of these things in my past life as a well, I'm still a science writer.
But you guys are giving great presentations, really. I mean, I've been to many big institutions where PhDs are talking down to some of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm very impressed. Yeah, Matt. Where did you get the idea for testing these? Um, I don't know. We were just looking at sort of different physics principles and stuff. Maybe you stumbled upon this one. It seems sort of interesting. So. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so for the period, did you have to make it so that it was, like, was there a certain <laughs> angular displacement that I had to remain within, or? Um, well, like, some of the periods um, with objects with, like, really high moments of inertia had periods that were almost like 50 seconds and because of the tensile strength or like the torsion constants of the string they would spin around really slowly and we'd have to like consciously make an effort to see where it like stopped and that was like half a period and then spun around the other direction um, but there wasn't like a certain like angular displacement we were looking for. That was something that maybe we could have measured, but we didn't really find an equation where that related to it. Mm -hmm. But so, like, is there the same thing with standard pendulums where, um, like, the angle, like the small angle approximation for normal pendulums we doesn't apply? We didn't really find any, on all the sources we looked at. There wasn't really evidence that there was a small angle approximation. So. Some of our displacements were in that range of like 30 degrees or so, and some were larger, but we found that it's a, it's a little linear relationship either way. So. Cool. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Pretty good.